Welcome back to 7 Day Yield. I'm Haley Zimring. It's not easy for financial institu institutions to serve aging boomers and millennials alike. Mitch recently sat down with Capital One's John Sabino to hear how they juggle diverse customer bases and what's next for wealth management. Let's take a listen. So help me understand two really important demographic groups. The baby boomers who are aging and the millennials are sort of beginning the savings process. How is that sort of coming to play in a wealth management business? Sure, yeah, the, um, the baby boomers are a real force. 10,000 baby boomers hit age 65 every day and they will for the next 10 years. Uh, the big issue they have is they haven't saved enough for retirement. Um, at age 65, the average uh, retirement plan is only around $250,000, so it's clearly not enough. For us, there's only so much we could do helping them invest. Their real issue is they're gonna have to work, work longer or potentially save more. So it's a real focus for us. Is it fair to say there's a lot of anxiety in the minds of baby boomers around retirement? There's a, there's a lot of anxiety, not only um, with regard to retirement, but if you look at lifespans, boomers are increasingly caring for their parents. So they're, they've got a double whammy. They've got their children that they had to educate. Sometimes they're moving back in. They've got their own retirement concerns they're worried about, and then they're looking at, at parents who are living longer. So they're really first generation that's, that's getting whacked from all sides. So let's talk about the boomers' kids, the millennials, yep. and you have a bank that has a retail platform. Are you seeing millennials beginning the savings process? We are, and millennials are very different than other investors. Obviously, they grew up um, and are very comfortable with technology. So one of the things that they're enamored with is this, this robo-advice. So go online, look at everything um, online, get instant messaging in, in terms of uh, your investment updates and portfolio. So we're spending a lot of time. Most competitors in the industry are looking at what are you going to do about robo advice? But the touch that's required for the baby boomers, because they are accustomed to touch, is different from the lack of touch that the millennials have. How do you reconcile that in a platform like yours? Yeah, you, uh, it's a good question. Essentially, you have to solve for all of those problems. Um, I think sometimes in the wealth management industry, we try to pigeonhole clients only into, into one bucket. You actually find uh, people above age 65 also like to use a lot of those those online tools and robo advice. So what you have to do is build the platform so that you solve for each of those and let, and let clients uh, migrate to what they go to. What's really interesting is we've done some research and if you ask a millennial uh, what happens uh, when you get $5 million, they say, oh, I wouldn't do any of this. I wanna talk to somebody. I, I actually want a team of people that I could interact with. So there's a lot of people in the industry trying to make bets. A lot of private equity money is going into these robo-advisors. In the role of the baby boomers in sort of philanthropy and sort of pu putting money aside for, you know, charities and the like. Yeah, we do, we do a lot of uh, work with clients when they're thinking about estate planning. And most clients obviously want to take care of their heirs, their children and grandchildren, but it's always a very active discussion around philanthropy. And I think in past generations, they would do that through their will. It would be something that would happen years out. The big trend that we see is they want to do it during their lifetime. They want to see what the impact is. And potentially, depending upon their level of net worth, they actually want to be involved, uh, maybe set up their own foundation and, and be hands-on and, and look at the issues that they really care about. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about your real passion in life, which is golf. Sure. And what the audience may not know is you've played the top 100 golf courses in the world. So in the time that's left, you can give everybody a little bit of a tour through that and your book that's coming out in April. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's something I, I am passionate about. Um, I'm very lucky. People have been very nice to me over the years. Um, and as you said, um, it, it took 15 years to do that and tying it back into the philanthropy. Um, the reason I decided to do it was so many people helped me along the way. I thought it would be a good idea to give back. So um, all the money that, that is made on the book, I'm going to donate to charity um, as a way of giving back to, to the golf world. And how, many, how much money on golf bets did you lose in the course of that 15 years? Yeah, <laughs> well, one, one of the things you can't do, you can't add that up and you can't add up the total cost of trying to play all those courses. Yeah. Those are two of my rules. One of the things I only do is I count golf winnings. I never count golf <laughs> losing, right. and I'm up. Yeah, it's I like, only it's count like gambling. <laughs> I only count winnings. Well, John, thanks for joining us. Happy to do it, Mitch. Thank you.